Um, my name is Tasha Banks. I am the project director for the Frontline Community Partnerships for Climate Justice. And um, I'm also the assistant director for the Division of Community Engagement and Health Equity at Del Med. Next slide, please. So I wanna introduce our wonderful team, our principal investigators, Miriam Solis, who is assistant professor at the School of Architecture, Carmen Valdez, associate professor and division chief of the Community Engagement and Health Equity Division, and also an associate professor of social work. And then Catherine Perez was one of our wonderful research assistants from the School of Architecture, and Anna Chatham, another research assistant from the School of Social Work. Next slide, please. So just to give a quick overview, so we work with frontline communities to understand the consequences of carbon emissions for health, as well as the challenges and opportunities behind decarbonization strategies. Next slide. And decarbonization is essential, but it tends to be approached technically. And our approach um, aims to lift up community expertise, their lived experience, and we also aim to apply inductive methodologies in response to the climate crisis. So our main focus is on working with youth and um, the, the schools uh, where students of color predominate are more, more likely to have high levels of neurotoxins in those environments. And we also know that youth of color know and make place. And so they know their neighborhoods, their communities, their schools, and those schools are community anchors. And um, this is you know, the, the focus of our project. So to talk a bit more about our methods, I will turn it over to Carmen. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I will be speaking more about the methods because as Tasha said, we really want to lift up the voices of youth and youth in the places that, um, you know, where they live in, where they go to school, where they play. And so, um, it is critical for us that we use community-based participatory research so that we can incorporate different sources of knowledge and also democratize knowledge so that knowledge isn't coming from academics, um, but that knowledge and lived experience is being accounted for and engaged in informing practices and policies. And we know that um, there's knowledge coming from schools in terms of their mitigation plans, knowledge coming from cities in terms of their mitigation plans. And so we're trying to also bring a youth perspective as to what those mitigation plans could look like. Um, but we don't just want to generate knowledge. We want our knowledge to be actionable. Um, the idea being that the more stakeholders we can bring to the table, um, the more people can learn about what they're doing individually, but also collectively, that um, investments that we can we can focus investments in the areas that matter most to youth um, who have this knowledge. And so it's critical for us to partner with um, not, not only be part of an interdisciplinary team like we are, but also to have partnerships with community organizations. Um, and our primary partner is EcoRise, um, and many of you are familiar with EcoRise. Um, you know, they are an organization that is based in Austin, but they actually do work statewide as well as across the country, um, working with K through 12 education. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, and the other piece that I want to highlight about our method is, is the idea of stakeholder engagement. Um, and so we are building um, specific uh, modes of engagement that bring in different um, stakeholders to the table. So uh, having coalitions um, composed of people from the public, but also from schools, from city offices, from community organizations, many of which are already doing um, their own initiatives. So bringing them as part of a coalition to um, set the agenda um, so to speak, so that we are all working based on a shared goal, you know, similar to like a collective impact model. Um, secondly, we also would like to have an, a, uh, or not would like to, but we are planning to have a faculty advisory board so that our methods and our dissemination are um, rigorous and they're targeted 
Um, and then also engaging youth themselves um, and bringing the knowledge that comes from the coalitions, the faculty advisory board, the, the youth photo voice um, and in their narratives, um, bringing it all together um, towards the end of our project as part of a public meeting or an incubator where these different sources of knowledge are shared and that um, leads to the actionable part of the project, which is people investing in small scale projects. So in terms of the photo voice specifically, uh, we, we have a process and then we also have a specific approach to analyzing the data. So our process is that we will host workshops um, with youth that have been identified by EcoRise through their existing programs. Um, and we are specifically looking at youth that are um, from communities that have been underrepresented in this type of work. And so we will host, starting this summer, we will host these workshops, work with youth on how to, on providing a rationale, on discussing the ethical considerations of doing this type of work, photographing, what do you photograph, what do you capture, how do you do it justice, um, how to get permission from others that you might be photographing in your community, and then also training them on specific techniques and um, you know, once they go out and take the, take the photographs, we would continue to work with them in the workshop model to, for them to select the most compelling photographs and then training them, coaching them um, along the way on writing narratives of what they um, photographed. And then, um, so that, Writing those narratives involves a process of analysis that's called SHOWED, and SHOWED stands for what do you see? So they would write about what they see in the photograph, what they perceive to be happening, like really happening there. Like, is this, um, it, for uh, the example of what they might see in a park, you know, they see trash or they might see, but what is really happening? So what is happening is maybe that people are, um, you know, that they don't have places to be um, in a park, uh, in a place that's safe, that's healthy. And how does that relate to their own mental health um, or their own learning as young people um, or, or being? And then why does that condition exist? And we expect that that would lead to equity um, conversations. And then what can others, such as our stakeholders from our coalitions, city offices, organizations, schools, what can they do about it? So we're really asking them to envision um, what a decarbonized or more um, safe environment looks like for them from an environmental perspective. And I also just wanna point out that from what Tasha said previously about you know, youth make plays and youth also experience place in very different ways. And when we're talking about youth of color, um, many of them experience their streets and their neighborhood as unsafe, where there's a lot of police involvement, where they could be detained, where they could be deported. Um, and so, you know, where there's racial profiling. And so we expect that some of those issues are gonna come up as part of the, the photo voice exercise and the narratives. And I will turn it over to Miriam to talk about timeline and actual updates on where we are with the project. Uh, a year ago is that in the um, last 12 months we'll be working on planning and team building um, year two, which extends through the summer, we'd be working on forming um, the coalitions. Year three, we'd really focus on the photo voice and narrative. As you heard, um, though, we did decide uh, because, um, because of that working relationship with EcoRise to start the photo voice. Um, and then as we started um, working with collaborators in ideally two other places aside from the Austin area, we'd be doing photo voice into year three. So through next year, 
Um, year four um, is going to be an incubator where we um, have an exhibition. And, and this is very central to the photo voice method where we show what was collected, um, the information that was gathered, um, ideally to decision makers um, to shape um, and inform planning processes that would lead to small scale projects um, to improve or create places that are more reflective of community priorities. Then year five would be a lot of wrap up um, and final reporting. And um, I, I'd like to say that as part of year one and the team building part of it, that's um, been a very exciting part of what we're doing um, and have been doing. Um, and that's certainly reflected in our GRAs and the leadership role Tasha has assumed um, in this project. Um, which we're all very excited about. So a brief um, update on the partner and coalition update. We do have, as we've said, an ongoing EcoRise partnership. Um, and from the onset, one of the things we were very excited about is to make this a school-based partnership. So our approach has been that schools are not just schools, they're, um, they're anchors in communities and there are school communities that would be engaging as part of this. But we've actually faced several challenges um, in working with schools, um, largely because of COVID. So our plan, um, part, uh, I would say halfway through last year was to team up with EcoRise and the new Climate Youth Equity Council um, to um, initiate our photo voice. The Climate Youth Equity Council would ideally be comprised of youth from historically marginalized communities. But we actually, with our collaborator EcoRise, encountered many challenges in being able to recruit young people from historically uh, marginalized communities for the Climate Youth Equity Council. And so that's why um, EcoRise and our team, we've gone back to the drawing board um, in terms of youth recruitment. Um, and we've set the goal of doing our first um, set of photo voice workshops in early summer. members of whom are here today, Kevin and Sergio. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're very thrilled to have um, this group of people whose knowledge we can tap, but also potentially who are leading very important projects themselves and um, who have projects that we might be able to contribute to in coming years. We do hope um, to have a more formal meeting with our faculty advisory board and to give you all a, an, an update later this spring ideally before our first round of workshops, um, when we've recruited our youth um, to participate in the program and we have a stronger game plan um, for um, the other two places where, we're, where we'll, we will be working um, and what the timeline associated to that may look like. And Kevin and Sipka, we certainly welcome questions from you today um, and conversations leading up to that um, more um, formal gathering as well. Um, so, um, oh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Kathy because even though we faced some recruitment challenges when it came to the Austin Youth Climate Equity Council, um, we have sustained our engagement in that. Thank you, Miriam. Um... Yeah, I will briefly just talk about the, the Youth Climate Equity Council um, that EcoRise led, and they launched it last fall. I don't know if you all know, but they also have one in um, uh, Houston and one in San Antonio, which kind of stem from the major office, but the, the Austin one is kind of a different model. So the goal of the Youth Climate Equity Council is uh, to provide a platform for, for the student um, to learn and also engage in local climate action uh, while collaborating with the schools over here in Austin specifically. Um, they're pretty focused on uh, supporting the AISD sustainability plan and the implementation of the city of Austin climate equity plan. So uh, they have been hosting um, speaker and workshop series together with the San Antonio youth. So the youth from able to kind of share that space and share some experiences. Um, and our team has participated in, in two of them. 
the first one we attended last fall. And it was more like an introduction to the institutional players around sustainability um, that EcoRise is in partnership with. So we had the folks from the city of Austin, uh, city uh, office of sustainability. Also, we had uh, the sustainability manager, Darian Clary, I think is her name, from AISD and us from the University of Texas and Medium kind of introduced, um, you know, the PTT 2050 project uh, to them. And so uh, the next slide, please, Anna. For their February convening, which was um, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, EcoRice asked us to present the method of photo voice to the youth because they are going to use it in their community impact projects. Um, so Miriam and I spent one hour approximately with the youth and we spoke um, on the importance of understanding place, uh, shared the value of local knowledge production and formally presented the, the showed method that Carmen already um, explained and that they will hopefully follow to build compelling narratives around um, their environmental projects. And yeah, I think uh, both Miriam and myself kind of shared our own personal uh, connections to issues of equity and environmental concerns. Um, and I think it's important for you to see that being modeled, um, to know that also like within academic research in environmental issues, um, that there is space for these other narratives and this more qualitative approaches to, to knowledge production. So we are, we are excited to see what, what they come up with in, in the coming months. So I'll share a couple more things we've been working on because I think they've been very important lessons in um, undertaking um, the particular methods that we're committed to um, and the game plan, they're these things are going to inform the game plan moving forward. So um, IRB, both within UT and um, in school settings, can be a very complicated process. And um, we're writing into our proposal um, to the IRB. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. It's, it's saying, I hope that's okay. Um, how to think about equitably recruiting um, and implementing the project. Um, and one of the things that's come up as part of this, and, and I, I think I mentioned this, is that what the, one of the biggest challenge we, challenges we had to recruiting youth of color um, from um, historically marginalized communities is that um, schools have been very hard hit um, by COVID, um, teachers, are overworked, um, students are also very tapped. And so AISD um, put a stop on um, accepting applications for active re research. Um, so that that is, COVID also presented itself as a major challenge in, in just getting approvals um, for our project. Um, and then um, kind of a, update on other things we've been working on. We've submitted um, several letters of interest um, for proposals. They haven't been funded. Um, and again, some of the reasons for that are the challenges associated um, with partner capacity as well. Um, and we've gleaned some important lessons from that with regard to um, the importance of developing relationships with foundations who increasingly seem interested in community-based um, participatory research. Um, and something that we also wanna do in the coming year is more thoughtfully think about bringing in mental health um, as a critical aspect in our work. And this would draw on Carmen's expertise, but it's also something that came up in um, our planning meetings with AISD um, and this Office of Sustainability and Equalize, um, the winter storm, for example, has been cited as an example of something that really affected youth, um, but that we don't have a lot of information about, um, both in terms of how young people were affected and how um, they dealt with the consequences of that extreme weather event. So those are um, our plans moving forward. Please feel free to reach out to me um, or really anyone on the team um, should you have any additional questions moving forward? And we're happy to answer any questions. 